It's an episode of elections at today's Daily Debrief, one that's currently ongoing and one in the near future. We begin with Pakistan, where the results of the historic process that took place on Thursday are trickling in amid much chaos. Now, as of now, and this is important, as of now is evening on Friday. It does seem like independence backed by the Pakistan Tehreek Insaf party of former Prime Minister Imran Khan have a slight edge. Now, it is important to note that the party was not allowed to contest in these elections officially because it was denied its symbol and thus its candidates took part in the elections as independents. The delay in announcing these results has already led to a lot of controversy with the PTI, that is Imran Khan's party, alleging rigging. While we don't know the final results yet and a lot may change by the time that this episode is out, the results so far itself indicate that the, this is a landmark election. We go to Abdul for more. Abdul, thank you so much for joining us. A very interesting uh, election in Pakistan. Of course, the results are delayed also a controversy, but uh, from the results available right now, it looks like the candidates backed by the PTI uh, you know, are in the lead. And of course, this was quite unexpected, I suppose, although we had talked about it before. But uh, while uh, we are recording it, uh, what is evening uh, uh, on Friday in Pakistan? Results still a lot more results to come. So take us through what is available right now. Well, Prashant, as per the Election Commission of Pakistan's official results, which have been there, which have been announced, and which is reported by the local media in Pakistan, uh, only 86 uh, seats have been announced. Uh, we should remember that there are only 20, 266 seats which are contested. Out of that one seat, of course, because of the technical reason, it is not uh, uh, the election will held, uh, will be held on that seat later. So out of 265, only 86 uh, results are out so far. And this is, uh, as you rightly pointed out, quite late. Uh, the official results were to be announced as per the ECP's uh, official announcement uh, uh, on Thursday late night. But this is more than 12 hours, uh, in fact, more than 16 hours, since, and, and that only 33 to 40% um, seats uh, results of that is out. And as per the record, uh, as per the ECB's uh, 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 official uh, results, uh, out of these, 33 seats have been won by uh, the candidates which are independent. Of course, all of them are backed by PTI, as it is claimed by them. And then the, the uh, PLM and uh, Pakistan Muslim League, Nawaz, which was considered to be the uh, leading, uh, which was considered to be the front runner, uh, in all official channels is basically trailing with 27 seats. Uh, PPP is uh, uh, very close by with 18 seats uh, so far. Rest of the seats are with uh, other parties. Some of them are also independent. So uh, uh, this is the official uh, status at this point. Of course, uh, uh, there are, as you rightly pointed out, there is controversy. Uh, PTI in particular has uh, contested uh, uh, the results announced so far and claimed that they have won majority uh, 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 so uh, already and uh, they are also uh, alleged that uh, the election commission of pakistan is indulging indulging in rigging of results right uh, abdul so just to go back to that point which is that you know, uh, like you said, many all the official channels and official narrative was that the PTI was pretty much finished. The Pakistan Muslim League Nawaz, or former Prime Minister Nawaz Sharif, was said to, you know, lead. There, there had been an agreement. So, what do you think prompted? Of course, there will be more time for more detailed analysis maybe next week. But right now, what do you think has prompted this kind of a result, which seems quite surprising? Well, Prashant. Uh... See, even in this result officially, which is announced, see, the, me, there are more than uh, almost uh, 150 seats which officially uh, are to be declared. And uh, it seems that uh, whatever uh, the Pakistan media is reporting and or, or has been reporting since last night, in majority of those seats, uh, independents have been leading. Uh, of course, official results may be different, but that's what the uh, 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 the version is there, at least in the public domain. And that is the basis on which there are claims made that there, there is an attempt to kind of manipulate the final results and so on and so forth. Uh, what prompted this, of course, is quite obvious. Uh, the reason behind it, uh, which were obvious during the public opinion surveys conducted by different uh, agencies before the uh, final vote uh, that 
there is a widespread anger among the pakistanis at at at, at this moment uh, but and particularly it this anger was also channelized by the imran khan's party ever since they were basically removed from power in april 2022 through a no confidence vote so imran khan and pti had pitched that this is basically uh, they have been removed unfairly because of the external intervention and the army and other political establishment have been against them and and that basically had led to a kind of greater uh, mobilization behind imran khan and pti and despite the fact that they were not allowed to contest as a political group and all the candidates of pti are contesting as independent in seems uh, there is a popular uh, mobilization behind them that is also reflected in the uh, final voter turnout though official uh, figures are not out but uh, uh, the speculations are that this is unprecedented in pakistan's history uh, uh, and much more than of course than uh, 50% which was there in 2018 last national elections so that shows that the the, uh, the additional mobilization people came out and voted primary one of the major reasons of course is the anger against the established political party the way nawaz sharif was brought in and pushed uh, and way pti and imran khan were pushed behind uh, that basically uh, has infuriated people that is what uh, the uh, analysts are saying uh, of course there, there are also reasons which are much more grounded uh, reasons and you can say much more structural in, in nature in a sense that pakistan economy in particular has been uh, in very bad shape for last many years and it has become bad to worse in last you can say two years since imran khan was removed from uh, uh, from power and that basically had also added into uh, the anger against the established party and particularly the parties which were in power uh, in this period which is the pmln and uh, uh, ppp in alliance so uh, economic and economic uh, reasons which cre- uh, has created frustration among the people and of course the sense that there is a, a, a attempt to kind of uh, rig uh, uh, popular mandate there is attempt to sideline popular mandate these two things together could be uh, the factor behind this this kind of result which we are seeing at this moment uh, uh, in our front abdul thank you so much for that update we'll come back to you most probably on monday with uh, for a deeper analysis of the results as well From Pakistan we go to the United States and the legal challenges before Donald Trump all of which are connected to the elections later this year the US Supreme Court is hearing Trump's challenge of a Colorado court verdict which bars him from the state's primary on account of the insurrection attempt of January 6 2021 Trump has also recently hit with an adverse verdict on the question of immunity he enjoys which he is likely to contest too to understand these cases and more importantly their implication on the election we go to Anish Anish thanks so much for joining us so let's first go to the arguments currently uh, that at least the arguments that took place in the US Supreme Court on Thursday uh, what was the what was this case about what was Trump contesting basically well obviously the case we have covered about it uh, is the it's based on the Colorado Supreme Court uh, state supreme court ruling that disqualified Trump from standing in the ballot for the Republican primaries and obviously the this uh, this was followed by another uh, state supreme court ruling in Maine the state of Maine and in both these cases Trump was disqualified from standing as a candidate uh, in the party primary uh, it uh, kind of also essentially disqualifies him from standing even in the uh, the later presidential elections to be held in November this year now in both the cases the 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 case itself is uh, nothing new because what we have seen so far in the last few years uh, it is based on the insurrection case which is uh, the capital hill uh, rioting that happened uh, in january of 2021 when uh, trump incited essentially incited several of the supporters to fight like hell uh, and storm the the congress house the or the capital building which uh, holds the congress which was at the time uh, vetting the election results so the case itself uh, was construed by many who have proposed trump as a sign of insurrection because an insurrection can be essentially anything that 
undoes or uh, you know tries to upturn uh, the constitutional process of the United States. It has never been used. Now, one of the things is that in the this clause within the uh, within the Constitution, which is the only clause that allows for a disqualification of a candidate from running for president, has never been used. And Trump is probably the first person to be ever used. Uh, against uh, pretty much disqualifying him. The, uh, the clause itself was, in fact, uh, you know, created in the post-Civil War era United States to disqualify Confederate uh, leaders from contesting elections of any kind, for that matter, and prevent them from taking office, uh, any constitutional office. Now, uh, the, the case it, uh, before, uh, when it reached the Supreme Court, we had already... Uh, there was already uh, an understanding that it is most likely to uh, rule in favor of Trump because we are looking at a conservative supermajority. Uh, three of these judges were uh, Trump appointees themselves, uh, so it is quite unlikely for them to rule against him. And if it does, that would be very interesting, but the likelihood of that is not uh, some anywhere even in the horizon. But what kind of arguments they are going to go for is going, uh, going to be uh, interesting, and that will have major implications, not just for the upcoming elections, but also overall, uh, like who gets to stand and who gets to be disqualified. It kind of has a constitution um, remaking kind of implications. Now, uh, the judges all have already, like we had a very barely a two hour or three hour long uh, hearing session, and it was pretty much concluded with that. And so the judges are most likely to rule in favor of Trump. They have raised a lot of points where uh, one at, at least have raised this point that whether or not a single state has the uh, power to disqualify somebody from standing for a presidential election, which is a national election. While fair, but we have known for the past several years and uh, covering U.S. elections that uh, U.S. elections in general are you know, decided by a handful of states very often rather than uh, you know, any kind of popular mandate. Uh, on the other hand, uh, there has been arguments raised by, uh, you know, opponents, the people who have petitioned against Trump, uh, most of whom are Republicans themselves, uh, that uh, Trump cannot be trusted because there is, uh, there is a question of whether or not uh, there has been an insurrection or not, which is something that the judges have not touched so far, which actually kind of prevents them from actually making a and an, an, a judgment that would decide what kind of acts constitute an inst insurrection and by definition cons uh, decide whether or not Trump has the right to contest the election. So it is a very complicated thing. They have tried to shorten it uh, so that it favors Trump. And it is quite obvious at this point in time. And Anish, of course, there's another case as well, which is likely also to go to the Supreme Court that has to do with the immunity uh, Trump is, uh, you know, supposed to enjoy as president. Could you also detail that case for us? Yes, essentially, uh, the idea of immunity comes from the fact that uh, presidents or anybody holding a constitutional office is immune from uh, certain kinds of prosecutions and uh, obviously, uh, in some cases, also arrest. Uh, and in the case of Trump, Trump has been trying to use the immunity uh, clause to prevent uh, any kind of prosecution against him, whether uh, it be, uh, you know, uh, misplacing classified official files or, for that matter, uh, his case of, uh, you know, trying to buy himself out of uh, a sex scandal case or uh, even right now with the insurrection uh, case that uh, half a dozen or more than half a dozen insurrection cases that are still active and still going on. And uh, in all of this, he is trying to use the immunity clause to, you know, prevent any kind of prosecution uh, to be even begin with, not just, uh, you know, prevent himself from being arrested. Uh, that is something that will be quite interesting. This, the appeals court has uh, ruled against him, obviously, but it is for the Supreme Court to decide. It, uh, and we have to wait and see how that is going to uh, pan out again. We we can obviously expect a favorable ruling for him. It is just the kind of legal definition or the arguments that the Supreme Court, the courts, uh, would put forth in deciding giving out their judgments that will be more impactful than 
uh, you know, the case at hand. Uh, on the other hand, uh, as I said, like the immunity itself uh, still kind of continues in many ways because as long as the case continues, uh, he is pretty much immune from even, uh, you know, uh, the disqualifications that he has been put through. Uh, and in many ways, it, there is a de facto kind of immunity that is afforded to him at this point, uh, which he is using, obviously, uh, well in his election campaigns, and, uh, you know, in the current state. And we have seen uh, primary after primary where he has used, uh, you know, several clauses as well. Uh, there was also uh, the, case, uh, the question of whether or not he can, and that comes to you know the question of whether or not he can talk about uh, the cases that are already being heard in the in different courts, in federal courts especially, and that is also something that has become a central focus right now because previously he has been reprimanded for uh, you know even you know making claims against judges uh, during his election campaigns. So these are definitely going to have an impact. We have to wait and see because, again, primaries and the cases are going to take months uh, to decide. Uh, and in November is still a long way to go. So there a lot of things can happen. But uh, at least in the case of uh, the insurrection, the insurrection charges against him, uh, we might have a judgment shortly. And its uh, implications and the kind of arguments that we will see there can also have an impact in several other of these other cases uh, against him right now. Well, Anish, of course, the million dollar question is that <clears throat> what impact is this having on Donald Trump, the candidate? Uh, like you said, the primaries are ongoing in many states. It's a long process, but it's already started. Uh, he seems to be steamrolling his way to the campaign, but both at the Republican Party level and at the national level, what impact? Uh, is there any impact at all? Definitely, he's using it as a plank right now. Uh, he's trying to present, and he has always presented himself as this sort of martyr-like figure uh, being hounded by, uh, you know, Democrats and uh, at some level, the political elites. Uh, this also harks back to his uh, 2016 uh, election campaign where he has presented himself as the political outsider, uh, you know, and compared to DC insiders. Uh, obviously, that is not true when we look at some of the bad facts, but uh, a lot of people are definitely taking this up. Uh, the kind of support that we're seeing within the Republican Party, uh, even in uh, the Nevada primary where he wasn't uh, contesting, he wasn't allowed to contest. And, uh, you know, there were an overwhelming support to none of the above candidates. Uh, option uh, clearly shows that he has significant support within the Republican primaries or the Republican Party as a whole, which has now increasingly uh, become more Trump, more pro-Trump than it was, say, a couple of years ago. Uh, but on the other hand, this is uh, how it is going to affect the electorate at large, which is obviously much bigger than the Republican Party and its voters is something that is some uh, that we need to wait and see because the electorate, as we know, is becoming even more polarized on several of these questions. And polarized elections often have, uh, you know, very uh, very unpredictable results. And we can't really say how things are going to because we never really expected him to even lose. Many of us didn't expect him to lose the 2020 elections because of how polarizing it was at the time and how much support he had. Uh, you know, garnered at the time. Uh, nevertheless, uh, it, he lost that election and it is still going to be a similar level of unpredictability that we can see in the coming days. But definitely the polarizing factor is huge and that is, that is, uh, you know, bled into pretty much everything, media, civil society, pretty much every argument surrounding the election is pretty much about the cases of Trump and, and barely, uh, there is, at least in the mainstream media and the mainstream platforms, we do not see much on other issues, other major, uh, you know, day to day issues that actually affect average, uh, Americans. And that is something that, uh, uh, that is the, that is pretty much a direct outcome of these cases in many ways and how it is being used by the Trump campaign right now. Right, Anish, thank you so much for that update. We'll come back to you. Definitely an issue that's not going anywhere for many months now. That's all we have in today's Daily Debrief. We'll be back with a fresh episode tomorrow. Meanwhile, do visit our website, peoplesdispatch.org. Follow us on all the social media platforms. And if you're watching this on YouTube, please hit the subscribe button.